It is my great pleasure to introduce Rahul Nand Kishore as today's colloquium speaker. Rahul is a condensed matter physicist and professor at CU Boulder, where he is also a director for their Center for the Theory of Quantum Matter. Following undergraduate work at Cambridge and doctoral work at MIT, Rahul spent three years as a PCTS fellow before joining the faculty at Boulder. I'm fortunate to be a student at Princeton while Rahul was a PCTS fellow, and I learned a tremendous amount from interacting with him during that time. Rahul's work is notable not just for its unusual creativity and conceptual depth, but it's all the more remarkable for the number of different areas in which Rahul's work has made milestone contributions, ranging from his PhD work on graphene to his widely influ influential postdoctoral work on many-body localization and non-equilibrium dynamics, followed by several not notable contributions to the theory of fractal. He's been recognized by a number of awards, including early career awards from the Department of Defense and fellowships from the Sloan and Simons Foundations. Please join me in welcoming Rahul, and I'm excited to hear him speak about ergodicity breaking in quantum dynamics. Thanks, Vedika. Uh, great to be here and to have a chance to tell you about a problem which I've been obsessing about uh, for you now the best part of the last 10 years, uh, ergodicity breaking in quantum dynamics. I could say, Along the way, over the past 10 years, I've benefited from interactions with a great many people, but some of them I'll single out for special mention. So this is Vedika, who just introduced me. This is my colleague, Andy Lucas, uh, who was part of the program. This is Boulder postdoc David Stephen. This is Boulder postdoc Ollie Hart, part of the program in the audience. Uh, and this is Boulder student Charlie Stahl, and sort of also various others listed below. So with that said, Let's get started. Uh, I'm a condensed matter theorist. Our slogan is that more is different. Uh, and really, you know, as I understand it, condensed matter theory is all about the search for new kinds of emergent phenomena, new ways in which you have a system of many interacting degrees of freedom and you get surprises out that wouldn't have been there in a few body setting. Uh, now, most of condensed matter has been done in thermal equilibrium. Uh, where you know, there have been a lot of triumphs and where the possibilities by now are relatively well understood. Whereas non-equilibrium systems, these are really, you know, here there be dragons territory where we can have surprises, things we would never have expected in thermal equilibrium. And as I see it, the understanding of many body physics in a non-equilibrium setting is the great open challenge for condensed matter physics or condensed matter theory particularly in the 21st century. Now, I should say that you know, really this is true for both classical and quantum out of equilibrium systems. But my own work has focused on quantum systems. And so the rest of the talk is going to be sort of quantum flavor as well. But of course, you no know, classical non equilibrium many body systems are also in extremely interesting. And indeed, there can be a great deal of synergy between classical and sort of quantum non equilibrium understanding. Okay. The way I'll structure the talk is as follows. I'll begin by introducing the notions of quantum thermalization and ergodicity. Uh, and then I'll talk about how we can break ergodicity, and this will be the heart of my talk. Uh, and I'll introduce you to three ways in which we can break ergodicity, many-body localization, protonic symmetries, higher form symmetries. You can think, I mean, this list is in chronological order, so this is the order in which we discovered these th these things historically, uh, but it's also, in a certain sense, an increasing order of robustness. And that should become clear as I go along in my talk, and you know, we'll conclude with a summary of what we've learned, some outlook. Okay. okay, let's start by setting the stage. The game we're playing is we're considering a many-particle quantum system, which is well isolated from the environment, so it's time evolving according to its own Schrodinger equation. So psi is the wave function of this many particle quantum system, H is the Hamiltonian, and this here is the Schrodinger equation according to which the system is evolving. And what we would like to understand is what sort of long time state does the quantum time evolution bring this well isolated quantum system? This is both an extremely important fundamental question. And also a question of great relevance for quantum simulation, 
and sort of you know, quantum computing architectures, synthetic quantum matter, cold atoms, and so on. Now, what should we expect? Our usual intuition is that dynamics bring systems to thermal equilibrium. The process of going to equilibrium is somehow associated with a loss of memory of the initial conditions. If I have a cup of coffee and I pour in some cream, I wait a while, it goes to equilibrium, it becomes some uniform light brown color. I don't know where the cream was poured in. I don't know much about the initial conditions anymore. But now you could raise an objection and you could say, hang on, Schrodinger time evolution is unitary. It means it preserves all information about the initial conditions all times. Does that mean that quantum mechanical systems cannot go to equilibrium? Well, you know, not so fast. Because if the only way to extract information about the initial condition is to, men is to measure of a Gardro's number of degrees of freedom, well, that's not practical. That's not something we can do now. It's not something we'll ever be able to do. So the meaningful question is what do accessible measurements see? Accessible measurements are typically you know, they're typically local in real space. They're typically measuring a few degrees of freedom at a time. And the meaningful question is whether accessible local measurements see thermal equilibrium at long times or not. And this is intimately bound up with the notion of ergodicity. When we learn about statmec, we learn about macrostates, which are characterized by measurable properties of the system, and also microstates, which contain a wealth of detailed information. And of course, there are zillions of microstates corresponding to each macrostate. And the ergodic hypothesis says that the system essentially cycles through all of the microstates corresponding to that macrostate. Now, obviously, the dynamics cannot change, let's say, conserved charge of the system. So you fix the charge of the system, and then it explores uh, all of the microstates consistent with those conserved charges. When the ergodic hypothesis is true, this is the basic assumption of statistical physics, and then we can apply standard stat phys. Whereas, you know, if the ergodic hypothesis is not true, or colloquially, the ergodicity is broken, then the entire edifice of statistical physics no longer really applies. And now we're into, you know, here there be dragons territory. And so for the rest of the talk, what I'd like to focus on is ways in which ergodicity can be broken. So ways in which an isolated many particle quantum system can fail to come to thermal equilibrium under its own dynamics. Now there's a few historical answers. So the, you know, the oldest best known example is integrability. So if you have a system which has infinitely many conserved quantities, it won't thermalize in any conventional sense. The integrability is, is a fine-tuned phenomenon. So you have some very special Hamiltonian it has integrable structure. You perturb it a little bit. And generically, the integrability will go away. The time scale on which it will go away will typically be a low-order polynomial, the perturbation strength. As perturbation goes to zero, this time scale could get long. Uh, but you know it's not crazy long. More recently, there's been discussion of quantum scars, where there's certain special initial conditions which don't equilibrate, which sort of appear to break ergodicity. But this again is generically a fine-tuned phenomenon. Generically, if you perturb scars a little bit, uh, no, they'll go away with a time scale that will be low-order polynomial in the perturbation strength. You may wonder if there's any way to get ergodicity breaking that's more robust than this. And the answer is yes, and that's what the rest of the talk is going to be about. Yeah. From my perspective, the more robust something is, the more interesting it is. Uh, and you know, these three are the most robust ways I know of to break ergodicity. Okay, let's start with the first, which is many body localization. So many body localization is a story that plays out in systems with strong disorder. What do I mean by disorder? Think of it as you have a bunch of particles. They're living in a random background potential landscape. Yeah. And that background potential landscape is extremely rough, full of deep valleys and high hills. And what can happen is that particles can get trapped on disorder. So you have some particles which are trapped in local minima. You can have other particles which are trapped in local maxima. Yeah? Because remember, we've got an isolated quantum system undergoing Hamiltonian time evolution, so it conserves energy. And if you're sitting at the top of a local maximum, you roll downhill, that lowers your energy, 
the energy is you know, can't just disappear. You've got to conserve energy. So you can get trapped on local maxima just as well. Now, the idea that excitations can get trapped in disorder, this is a very old idea. This is what Anderson won his Nobel Prize for. But in the original formulation, the idea was you know, this was for single particle systems or for interacting systems at zero temperature. And in the past couple of decades, what there has been a lot of work on is that you know, the same thing can happen for interacting many particle quantum systems at non-zero energy density. We've got interacting many body systems, which are not anywhere close to the ground state. They're not only at non-zero energy, they're at non-zero energy density. How robust is this? Well, first of all, it needs perfect isolation. If you don't have perfect isolation, it'll go away. In time scale, that's typically low order polynomial, the coupling to the environment. And it needs energy conservation. And energy conservation could just be in the flow case sense, where the energy is conserved modulo some discrete frequencies, but at least you need that. If you don't have energy conservation, there's no many body localization. It also needs strong disorder, as I just said. Now, if you have perfect isolation and energy conservation, then there exist exactly solvable points yeah, where you can exactly show this localization, and it's an exact statement. And you know, the non-interacting point is one of those exactly solvable points, but it's not the only one. There are others. And you could ask, OK, you know, those exactly solvable points are special points in the space of all Hamiltonians. What if I perturb about those exactly solvable points? Well, the generic answer is if you perturb about those solvable points, then the system will thermalize. But the thermalization will be a non-perturbative phenomenon, meaning that the time scale on which the system will restore ergodicity, a time scale will generically be super polynomially long. So now the time scale will blow up faster than any polynomial function, the perturbation strength. And this is very different to integrability or scars. And on some occasions, you can even show that the time scale is exponential in the perturbation. Really very long, can easily be made longer than experimental time scales maybe even longer than you know, the time scale of the universe. Now, for the special case of one-dimensional spin chains with short-range interactions, there's a claim from Imbri that this time scale may even be infinite. Now, this last point is not settled. There's still debate over this. But you know, on some level, I also want to emphasize that the spin chain model itself is not really good to infinite times. Because if you've got a system at non-zero energy density and you're waiting for long enough, you should be worrying about things like space fundamentally is not discrete. Physical systems live in continuous space. That translates into infinitely many energy bands at high energy. If you retain those in your description, then on long enough time scales, they'll come into play. And they'll cause thermalization. But the time scale will be exponential in the gap to those high energy bands. And you know, exponentially long time scales easily be made longer than experimental time scales. So, you know, enough for government work. Why is many body localization interesting? Well, one reason why it's interesting is because it's really the first example that we found historically of ergodicity breaking that's robust in the sense that I described. But the second reason is it provided a nice testing ground. We realized that you know in the ergodicity broken regime, you could have new sorts of phenomena without any analog in thermal equilibrium such as spontaneous symmetry breaking at non-zero energy density in one dimension. And so I think this is the simplest example of something new that happens in the localized regime, and I'd just like to really share that with you. Just to review some basics from stat class, the idea behind spontaneous symmetry breaking is that the state of a thermodynamically large system in all respect all the symmetries of the Hamiltonian. And the canonical example for illustrating this is the transverse field Ising model. So this is a system of spin one half variables arranged on a line. The Hamiltonian takes the following form. The sigmas here are Pauli matrices. Uh, and this Hamiltonian has a symmetry under flipping every spin. If you take every sigma z to minus sigma z and leave sigma x unchanged, and that's a symmetry of the Hamiltonian the Ising symmetry, the Hamiltonian, or no, Ising symmetry, but I'll stick to Ising. 
Uh, and it's well known that the ground state of this model takes the following form. It's you know, all spins up, plus or minus all spins down, cat state, rest, and quantum fluctuation. It's also well known, learn in MEC class, this ground state spontaneously breaks symmetry. How do you see that it spontaneously breaks symmetry? Well, there's some canonical diagnostics. You can look at the correlation functions evaluated in the exact eigenstates. And you can ask if they have long range order in real space, or you could pick an initial condition which explicitly breaks the symmetry. For instance, you could prepare the system in the superposition state with all spins up, and then you could look at order correlation functions. You could ask if the dynamics of the system scrambles that symmetry breaking initial condition or not, and see if you have long range order in the time domain. And by these standard diagnostics, the one dimension transverse field Ising model spontaneously breaks the global Ising symmetry in the ground state, but not away from the ground state. And we can understand that microscopically. If we're away from the ground state, we have domain walls in the pattern. That's places where the spin pattern changes up to down. And those domain walls can run around and allow the spin pattern to relax, spoiling the long range order, both in space and in time. This is the standard lore from Landau and Pyrrhus and the early founders of quantum statistical mechanics. Uh, now let's move to new stuff. And one new thing that I'll do is I'll take these coefficients in the Hamiltonian and I'll make them random. So I'll say these are random numbers drawn from some distributions of some width. And if that width is big enough, then this system will go into a many body localized phase. And what happens in the many body localized phase is that those domain walls are trapped on the random landscape generated by these random coefficients. And now the excited states also take the form, have some particular spin pattern, plus or minus its globally spin flipped counterpart, plus some dressing by quantum fluctuations. This is a phenomenon which we called mind state order. Okay, now you know you. In this regime, you can look at your standard diagnostics. You evaluate your correlation functions in the exact eigenstate. You see that you have long range order in space. Or you could prepare a particular spin pattern up here, down here, up here, down here, as an explicitly symmetry breaking initial condition. You could look at the order correlation functions. And now they'll have long range order in the time domain because the domain walls cannot move around. They're localized. So they're not able to relax the spin pattern. By the standard diagnostics, we'll have spontaneous symmetry breaking, even at non-zero energy density. In fact, we'll have spontaneous symmetry breaking everywhere in the spectrum of this Hamiltonian. It's not something which can happen in an equilibrium. There's theorems prohibiting this. But this is not an equilibrium setting. So here's stuff that can't happen in an equilibrium can happen. This is the simplest example of the sort of localization protected orders, you know, something happening out of equilibrium that cannot happen in equilibrium. Simplest and first, but there are many others. The most famous example, certainly the time crystals. So if you were at Vedika's uh, public lecture yesterday, you'll have learned about time crystals, which are the most famous example of this sort of localization protected order. And what it goes to show is that new stuff can happen once you break ergodicity. There's you know, one reason why ergodicity breaking is interesting. Yeah. We first learned about robust ergodicity breaking in the context of many body localization. As it turns out, many body localization is not the only game in town. Yeah? In the past few years, we have discovered alternative routes for ergodicity breaking, and that includes routes which don't rely on energy conservation or on short range perturbation. So, many body localization is robust in the sense that I described short-range perturbations, but not long-range perturbations. Some of the other routes we'll discuss will also be robust long-range perturbation. OK, now let's move on to route number two, tectonic symmetries. All right, so this is you know, an alternative route to ergodicity breaking, a completely distinct to many body localization. Uh, we came upon it sort of inspired by the study of fracton phases of matter. The fracton phases are certain exotic phases of topological quantum matter. We were interested in them for other reasons, but along the way, they sort of inspired a very rich vein of work in quantum dynamics. Uh, 
The great thing about this new sort of fractonic route to ergodicity breaking is that unlike many body localization, it does not rely on energy conservation. It could have a system subject to noise and you no know, ergodicity could still be broken. What it does require is it requires the imposition of finitely many conservation laws. Yeah? And a minimal sufficient set is to demand that charge and dipole moment of charge are conserved. I'll explain what that means in just a bit. And this route requires strict locality. So it will be robust to perturbations, but those perturbations will need to respect the symmetries and the perturbations will need to be strictly local. Later on, we'll see how to move away from this to no. that's robust to non-local perturbations, not yet. Okay, so you want to consider quantum dynamics conserving charge and dipole. Let's consider this in the simplest possible setting. And the simplest possible setting in which we can implement this is a one-dimensional spin chain. Now consider spin s variables in one dimension. Spin one is convenient for now, but not essential. Uh, and let's say that the z component of charge is cons uh, the z component of spin is conserved. The z component of spin is what I will call charge, and the position weighted charge is dipole moment. Yeah, standard definition of dipole moment from like Maxwell and M. Okay, now we want to consider quantum dynamics, which conserves these two quantities, and which is locally generated in real space. Which means if I have a single charge, a single charge cannot hop around. Because if a single charge hops, it changes the dipole moment. But if I have a dipole, a plus and a minus charge together, that dipole can translate freely. That doesn't violate any conservation. And I can also have processes like, for instance, this. And this process you could, you could interpret either as a charge hops to the left and emits a minus plus dipole to the right, or charge hops right and emits plus minus dipole to the left. And what we'd like to consider is the most general quantum dynamics. It conserves charge, conserves dipole, and is locally generated in real space. Now, the simplest way to build in spatial locality is by considering quantum circuit dynamics. So the people that are in the program will know all about quantum circuit dynamics. The idea is quantum mechanical time evolution is generated by some big unitary matrix. And you build that unitary matrix out of a bunch of little unitary matrices, these blue uh, rectangles, which we call gates, and concatenating all these little unitary matrices, which each of them acts compactly in space, that builds the big unitary, which implements quantum mechanical time evolution. If you're not used to thinking about quantum circuits, you may want to think about the Suzuki Trotter decomposition of time evolution, yeah? the sort of thing you do when you construct the path integral. So you have e to the i h t, you carve it up into little, little blocks, delta t, and each of those blocks you could think of as comprising one layer of this quantum circuit. Now, now we're, we're considering quantum circuit dynamics as a way of building in the fact that the dynamics is locally generated. We have some wave function, and it's acted on by these unitary gates that locally generates the dynamics, and we want to demand that the dynamics conserves charge and dipole, which means we demand that each of these gates is block diagonal by charge and dipole. Each of these is a matrix. That matrix is block diagonal by charge and dipole. It doesn't connect states to different charge and dipole quantum numbers. But other than that, we impose no further structure. So within each charge and dipole sector, this unitary can be a random matrix. And we can choose these little unitaries. We can choose them uniformly in space or we can choose them randomly in space, the answers don't change. We can choose them uniformly in time, or we can choose them randomly in time, and the answers don't change. Yes. Do you have any far off diagonal components? Do we have any far off diagonal components? Well, so what's right? So what's drawn here, so this is block diagonal by symmetry sector. Yeah. If yeah. I had components which were outside these blocks, those would be violating my symmetries. Sort of with my range three gates, these are the non trivial blocks that I have. If I made my elementary unitaries a bit bigger, my elementary blocks would get bigger. And within each block, I can have random matrix, but I can't have anything outside the blocks because then I would be violating my symmetry. Okay, so you know, what does this give us? Now, our basic expectation 
might be that, look, this is minimally structured quantum dynamics. Yeah, Two conservation laws, that's all I've demanded. I've even allowed it to be noisy in time. Maybe I should expect ergodicity. What would ergodicity mean? Well, if I start off in a state with a particular charge and dipole quantum number, and that charge and dipole quantum number cannot change, quantum dynamics cannot violate symmetries, but I might expect that I would sample all of the microstates with that charge and dipole. And so the long time average might look something like an equal weight superposition for all the microstates in that symmetry sector. And that's what's plotted on the left. That would be charge distribution that's essentially uniform over the system. Instead, if you do this numerically, what you see is something that looks like this. You start the charge on a single site, and it stays close to that site for all times. What you observe looks an awful lot like localization of charge. Yeah? And for this minimal implementation that I showed, charges are localized for almost any initial condition. But note that it cannot be Anderson localization and it cannot be many body localization because those things are light on energy conservation. And this is there even if I choose my gates randomly in time, meaning by Noether's theorem, I don't have energy conservation anymore. If I make the sort of elementary gates out of which I build my circuit bigger and typical initial conditions thermalize, but there is still an exponentially large subspace, which does not. So what's going on? That explanation emerged in these papers, and let me now share that with you. Let's start by explaining things sort of constructively. So I have a system which conserves charge and dipole. You know, let plus be my state of locally maximal positive charge, yeah. minus be my state of locally maximal negative charge, and let me consider a state of the form shown here. So this is a state labeled by some pattern of domain walls where the pattern changes from all plus to all minus. And I require that the domain walls are at least as far apart as the biggest operator that I'm using to generate my dynamics. Now let me look at the subsequent dynamics of the state. To generate the dynamics, I come in and I act with my you know, little local operators. Each of those operators has to conserve charge and dipole. Each of those operators acts across either zero or one domain walls. It can never act across two domain walls because they're too far apart by construction. If it acts across zero domain walls, then it acts on a region which is locally extremal charge. There's nothing you can do to that consistent with charge conservation. If it acts across one domain wall, it acts on a region which is locally extremal dipole given its charge. And you can't say shuffle around the plus and minus charges because that would change the dipole moment which means that any state of this sort must be an exact eigenstate of any quantum dynamics, which conserves charge, conserves dipole, and is locally generated on this scale m. Now, how many exact eigenstates like this are there? Well, no, you can get a lower bound very easily, carve up your system into blocks of size m, and each such block you could allow to be either all plus or all minus. That gives you a number of states, which is exponential and system size, yeah, which are simple product states on the computational basis, yet exact eigenstates, any dynamics which conserves charge and dipole and is locally generated on the scale M. The construction generalizes to arbitrary dimensions. In fact, in D dimensions, the number of such special eigenstates like this is exponential in system volume. And you can prove this inductively. It's exponential in L to the D, in any D dimension. What does this mean? Well, we've said again and again that you know, time evolution in quantum mechanics is generated by a unitary matrix. And that big unitary matrix is always block diagonal by symmetry sector. And because quantum mechanical time evolution cannot change the conserved charges, it cannot change the symmetry quantum numbers. Each symmetry sector is its own little block. But if the setup is ergodic, that's it. Within each symmetry block, time evolution matrix should just look like a random matrix. Yeah. Now what we have is very clearly not that. And the easiest way to see that is that the number of symmetry sectors is polynomial in system size, yeah. whereas there's these exponentially many states which have no dynamics at all. So sprinkled in all of my symmetry sectors, at a minimum, there must be states which don't mix with anything. 
So you know, with, within that symmetry sector, I definitely don't look like a random matrix. The unitary matrix is block diagonal the symmetry sector, but and within each symmetry sector, it further block diagonalizes into exponentially many subblocks, which are called Krilov subsectors. And there's a very broad distribution of block sizes. So there's these special eigenstates I was showing you. Those are like one by one blocks. Then there's blocks which are two by two, 10 by 10, 5 million by 5 million, some with size that diverges in the thermodynamic limit. And the dynamics never connect states in one block, states in another block, even if both of those states have the same symmetry quantum numbers. Yeah? Which means that ergodicity is broken. The system is not exploring all of its microstates consistent with you know, its conservation laws. This phenomenon goes by the name of Hilbert space shattering or Hilbert space fragmentation, and it's robust to any perturbations that respect two symmetries and strict locality. Uh, it can be realized, for instance, in ultra cold atoms. Uh, in a tilted potential, and in fact, it already has been seen in a couple of settings. Okay. What have we accomplished? We found an alternative route to ergodicity breaking, which does not rely on energy conservation. It does require the strict imposition of two symmetries and a strict spatial locality. Now, a short aside, so far I was talking about these special eigenstates, but we could also, I said that within each symmetry sector, there were these large blocks. Some of those blocks have size that diverges in the thermodynamic limit. It turns out that within those large blocks, the dynamics is, looks thermal, not with respect to the full symmetry sector, but with respect to those subsectors. So then you could ask what the approach to thermal equilibrium looks like, where we're now defining thermal equilibrium in a non standard way as sort of with respect to the subblock instead of with respect to the full symmetry sector. What should we expect? Well, we've got a system with conservation laws. The standard theory for the approach to equilibrium systems with conservation laws is hydrodynamics. Uh, and in fact, the sort of super standard behavior is diffusion. So you have some, some charge density and it evolves according to the diffusion equation, which has a characteristic length relationship between length scales and time scales, distance is like square root of time. Now, in this case, that's not what we get. The approach to equilibrium is still given by hydrodynamics, but it's not given by diffusion. Instead, it's subdiffusive. There's infinitely many hydrodynamic universality classes, uh, which all of which are subdiffusive. And this structure is also very robust. So how do we see this? Well, the easiest way to see it is to note that individual charges cannot move. The elementary mobile excitations are dipoles. And if you think back to Maxwell ENM, Maxwell ENM tells us that dipoles don't feel any force in a uniform field. Mm -hmm. If I put a uniform field across the system, then the conductivity would be zero. And then the Einstein relation tells me that if the conductivity is zero, then the diffusion constant would be zero. Yeah. So you know, this cannot be diffusion. The diffusion constant has to be zero. The approach to equilibrium has to be slower than diffusion. Uh, now you can sort of guess what it must be. You can also derive it from Keldish. The simple way of guessing it is to say that the mobile objects are dipoles. Dipoles move at point in direction j, they move in direction i. So the current is a two index object which keeps track of both the dipole orientation and motion. Uh, and so uh, the continuity equation must look something like this. And now we need the analog of fixed law. We want to know how the current is related to density gradients. Now we use the fact that dipoles move in response to gradients of the electric field. And gradients of the electric field are like two gradients of the potential. Yeah. So instead of having one gradient in my fixed law, I should have two gradients, put everything together. In my diffusion equation, instead of having a Laplace operator, I'll get a Laplace square operator. More generally, if I conserve charge and the first n multipole moments of charge, so n is zero is standard charge only, n is one is charge in dipole, and is two is charge dipole quadrupole, and is three is charge dipole quadrupole, you know, octopole, and so on. And I will get a modified diffusion equation of the following form, where I get n plus one powers of the Laplacian. So there's this infinite family of subdiffusive universality classes, which have characteristic of relationship between length scales and time scales. Length scale goes like time scale to some small power, smaller than diffusion. And what this power is is controlled by how many 
multiple moments you are conserving. This also can be observed in ultra cold atoms and indeed has been observed in ultra cold atoms. Okay, you know, end of aside, back to ergodicity breaking. First, we discussed MBL, which was a route to ergodicity breaking, which required energy conservation and strong disorder, but which was robust to arbitrary local perturbation. Then we discussed tectonic symmetries, which gave an alternative route to ergodicity breaking, which did not require energy conservation, but it did require symmetry restricting the perturbations and it required strict locality. And you may wonder, can you get ergodicity breaking that's robust to arbitrary perturbations without even demanding locality? Yeah. And if you'd asked me this two years ago, I would have said this is a crazy request. I mean, like, how can you put, if you don't even demand geometric locality, how could you possibly break ergodicity? But now, in fact, we know how to do it. So in the last part of my talk, I'll show you how you can get ergodicity breaking, which is robust even to non local perturbations. And the key here will be make use of higher form symmetry. Yeah? So higher form symmetries are something that's been discussed very extensively in the high energy physics literature. We're used to thinking of global symmetries where the symmetry operators act everywhere in space. We're also used to thinking of gauge symmetries. Higher form symmetries are intermediate between global symmetries and gauge symmetries. Uh, the symmetry operators act on manifolds of dimension lower than the dimension of space and those manifolds can be arbitrarily deformed. And it might seem that this is something very weird and exotic, but in fact, as I will show, you can get this emerging in very simple and natural models. Yeah? And once you have these sort of emergent layer form symmetries, this will give rise to robust, provable ergodicity breaking with topological stability, which in particular will be stable to even geometrically on local perturbation. Okay. What we will require now is enforcement of one single constraint. And that's like, you know, the most minimal thing I could possibly do. You've got to allow me something. So we're going to require enforcement of one constraint. If that one constraint is enforced exactly, then the results will be exact. If the constraint is imposed softly, so you know, I allow for constraint violating states offered high energy, then the results will be accurate out to a time that's exponential in the gap those high energy constraint violating states. Okay, let's illustrate this by example. The simplest example in which you can get something like this is what we call the CZP model. So the idea here is that we're dealing with a square lattice system where we've placed spin one half variables on the vertices of the square lattice. And the Hamiltonian takes the form H naught plus V, where V can be anything. It could be sum over X fields on every site, or it could be free sum xi, xj, where i and j can be anywhere. They don't even have to be close together. Or it could be xi, yj, zk, you know, xl, where i, j, k, l can be chosen freely. They don't even have to be close to each other. Yeah? x, y, z, here are the Pauli operators. The only requirement is that it should be k-local. This is quantum information language. What it means is that it is a sum of terms where each term in the sum is few body. So each term in the sum acts on only a few degrees of freedom at a time, at most k, and k is small compared to system size L. This is an incredibly minimal restriction to put. It can perturb with anything. It doesn't even have to be geometrically local. The only requirement is that it should be k-local in the sense that it's a sum of terms, and each of those terms acts on a small number of sites at a time, uh, where that small number is small compared to system size, but those sites don't even need to be contiguous in real space. And I assert that the ergodicity breaking will be robust for all such Vs. Obviously, the magic is all in H0. What is H0 doing? H0 is enforcing our constraint for us. Uh, H0 is you know, of the following form, sum over every plaquette, so the plaquettes are the little elementary squares, and on each elementary square, you act with this operator minus CZP, where CZP takes the following form. And what this does is essentially it penalizes having an odd number of neighboring upspins around any elementary plaquette. Yeah. So what you want to do is, you know, because of this minus sign, you want to make it so that 
know, e, this operator, it squares to one. Yeah? Squares to one, meaning it has eigenvalue plus one or minus one. And in order to minimize the energy, you want to give it eigenvalue plus one to every such operator. Anytime you give it eigenvalue minus one, you pay some large energy penalty j. And let's assume j is very large. Let's restrict to the constrained subspace where every such operator has eigenvalue plus one. How big is this constrained subspace? Well, you can actually enumerate the size of this constrained subspace exactly. It turns out this constrained subspace has a size which grows exponentially you know, in system volume, which is to say you know, this is an honest two-dimensional many-body Hilbert space. Yeah? It, it's sort of big enough that it can accommodate a non-zero entropy density, which means that it's meaningful to talk about thermalization or lack thereof within this constrained subspace. Now, in order to understand things better, it's convenient to go to a dual representation. And to understand this dual representation, I want to observe this Hamiltonian has two Ising symmetry. So if you flip every spin, okay, it's defined on the square lattice, which is bipartite. There's odd sites and even sites. It's two colorable. If you flip every spin on the odd sublattice, H0 is unchanged. If you flip every spin on the even sublattice, H0 is unchanged. There's two Ising symmetries. And it's convenient to go to the domain wall basis of the Ising symmetry. Yeah. Anytime you've got an Ising model, you can always go to the domain wall basis. There's two species of domain walls because there's two symmetries. Let's call those two domain walls red and blue. Our domain walls form closed loops because domain walls can never end. Uh, and what our constraint corresponds to saying is that red and blue domain walls cannot intersect. Yeah. So the constraint satisfying Hilbert space consists of two species of closed loops, red and blue, and red and blue loops cannot intersect. But the loops can fluctuate freely, subject to that basic constraint. Okay. So what does this sort of loop dynamics lead us to? Well, let's consider a state of the following form. Uh, so what I've shown here is a red domain wall which wraps all the way around the system, followed by a blue domain wall, then a red wall, then a blue wall, and so on. Yeah? So it's a dense packing of system spanning loops. There's lots of configurations like this because this pattern can wiggle in any which way. In fact, there's exponentially many configurations like this. But once I have made a dense packing of this sort, now any fluctuation that I make is going to create intersection. And in fact, in order to go from one, and you know, the intersections violate my constraint. And in order to go from one constraint satisfying state to another constraint satisfying state, what I got to do is I got to put a kink in the whole system. Yeah? So I got to act on every single domain wall at once, which means acting on order L sites at once, where L is going to infinity in the thermodynamic limit. And the only thing I have at my disposal is few body perturbation. I cannot do that. This state has no dynamics whatsoever. And its lack of dynamics has topological stability. If the constraint is imposed as a hard constraint, the topological stability is exact. If it's imposed softly, so if I have constraint violating states at high energies in my Hilbert space, I retain those in my analysis, and these statements will be valid out to times exponential in the gap, those high energy states. Small aside for you know, aficionados in the audience, once I go to the constraint subspace, in the constrained subspace, I actually have an emergent one-form symmetry. I have said many, many times that quantum dynamics is block diagonal by symmetry sector. We ought to be resolving by those one-form symmetries. Yeah. Uh, so let's do that. And when we do that, what we find is that there's two, you know, so big time evolution matrix becomes block diagonal. Each of these blocks is labeled by a different sort of one-form symmetry quantum numbers. And then we can ask about the dynamics in each of these blocks. And it turns out that there's two sorts of blocks. There's one sort of symmetry block within which the dynamics is ergodic. And what ergodic means in this context is that the dynamics is the dynamics of fluctuating loops, which is magnetohydrodynamics. And magnetohydrodynamics can be formulated as hydrodynamics of a one-form symmetry. And you now you sort of everything is predicted perfectly well by sort of magnetohydrodynamics. And there's other symmetry blocks which are made up of these densely packed states that I was talking about. 
in those symmetry blocks have no dynamics whatsoever. They're completely frozen, and the lack of dynamics has sort of topological stability. So there is rigidity breaking, but it has this all or nothing character where in some symmetry sectors there's nothing, and in other symmetry sectors there's no dynamics at all. Now we can get away from this all or nothing character by considering a broader family of models. So you know what we did in the subsequent paper is we generalized to a much broader family of models. Essentially, the one thing you change is you still do square lattice, but instead of having spin one half variables on each vertex, instead you place m state clock spins on each vertex. If m is two, then you get back exactly the model I was telling you about. But if m is bigger than two, then you get something new. The simplest possibility would be, say, the three-state clock model. Then can point there or there or there. All the three states, red, green, and blue. You know, or you could consider even more possible states. Again, you impose a single constraint to project into a subspace which has emergent airform symmetries. Uh, and okay, let me give sort of very high-level overview of what we get. Uh, when m was two, and when we had sort of Ising in one half variables. We had two species of domain walls, red and blue. When we go to the M state clock model, where M is bigger than two, we get M species of domain walls. If M is three, we'll have three species of domain walls, red, blue, and green. All of those domain walls will still form closed loops. Those sort of domain walls don't terminate. Uh, and we'll still have the same basic constraint, which is that domain walls of different color cannot intersect. The Hilbert space, constraint satisfying Hilbert space, which is still exponentially large in system volume, that constraint satisfying Hilbert space uh, will the space of domain walls and M colors cannot intersect, or M species of non-intersecting loops. Okay. Now let's consider some pattern. Yeah, There's some small loops. There's some loops which stretch all the way across the system. I have some pattern. Let me walk from left to right across the system. Yeah. Every time I encounter a system spanning loop, I will just record the color of the system spanning loop, which I encountered. If I walk from left to right on this state, uh, the first system spanning loop I encounter is this one, green. I write down green. And then I encounter this red one, red. And that's it. Yeah. So the record I would make for this particular state would be green, red. But you can readily convince yourself that this record, green, red, is a topological invariant. It cannot change in under the dynamics because the only way it could change is either I have to delete an entire system spanning loop, yeah, which requires acting on order L spins at once, or I have to take one system spanning loop, pass it through another, which creates intersections at order L places. So it violates my constraint order L number of times where L is system size is being taken to infinity. So this record, which we call an irreducible label, that is a topological invariant to dynamics. And there's exponentially many topological invariants because you know, first you can, you know, you, for your first system spanning loop, you can choose from any one of M colors or the next system spanning loop, you can choose any one of M minus one colors because it has to be a different color. The next one after that, you can choose any one of m minus one colors and so on. And you can put in loops at up to L places. They have sort of m minus one to the L possible topological invariants. Yeah? Each of these each of these sort of labels is topologically robust, cannot change under any few body constraint satisfying dynamics. Now, again, what does this mean for the time evolution maker? Time evolution matrix is block diagonal by symmetry sector. The number of symmetry sectors is polynomial in system size. Yeah? But I said that there is these exponentially many topological invariants, which straight away tells me that ergodicity must be broken. Yeah? My symmetry sectors must be breaking up into subblocks, where each subblock is labeled by a different topological invariant. Now what you can show is that there's motifs which have non-trivial topological invariant associated to them, but zero symmetry charge. So in any symmetry sector, you can bolt on a finite motif, changes the topological invariant, which means that now this ergodicity breaking is there in essentially every symmetry sector. Every symmetry sector, you block diagonalize 
into exponentially many sub-blocks, where each of those sub-blocks is labeled by a different topological invariant, and the dynamics cannot connect the state in one sub-block to a state in a different sub-block because that would change the topological invariant, even if the two states have the same symmetry quantum numbers. Yeah? And it's not all or nothing anymore because like now these blocks are not completely frozen. You can have non-trivial dynamics within a block labeled by a single topological invariant. Yeah? It's just that dynamics does not enable you to fully explore the symmetry sector because the dynamics cannot change the topological invariant. This generalizes also to open boundaries. It generalizes to higher dimensions. Might be some interesting things if we go to higher dimensions, which no, I won't talk about. Okay, so now that's essentially what I wanted to tell you. Let's conclude. Started by setting the scene, we said that, look, now when we learn stat mech, now in undergrad, we learned about the ergodic hypothesis, and it goes back all the way to Boltzmann, it says that the system explores all of its microstates uh, consistent with the conservation laws. And this is the foundational assumption of statistical mechanics. We build statistical mechanics on this foundation of the ergodic hypothesis. And if the ergodic hypothesis is wrong, if ergodicity is broken, then we're into here there be dragons territory, like all the sort of theorems and lore of StatMech no longer apply. we'd like to understand is ways in which we can robustly break ergodicity in the dynamics of a many particle but isolated quantum system. We discussed three routes to this ergodicity breaking. First, we discussed many body localization, which required energy conservation, effort isolation, and strong disorder. And if you had those three things, then the ergodicity breaking was robust to local perturbations, in the sense that there's exactly solvable points where ergodicity is broken forever and you perturb away from those exactly solvable points a little bit and it lives for times super polynomially long in the perturbation stream. Yeah, so it's... Then we discussed this alternative route to ergodicity breaking based on tonic symmetries. This did not require energy conservation, but it required a finite number of symmetries, at least two, and it was robust to symmetric, strictly local perturbation. Finally, I discussed the route to ergodicity breaking based on emergent form symmetries, which requires enforcement of a single constraint. This is the only structure we require. We don't require imposing it. Well, all we require is we require enforcement of a single constraint. And once you've imposed that single constraint, you're robust to arbitrary perturbations. Those perturbations don't need to be symmetry restricted, don't even need to be restricted to being geometrically local. The only restriction is they need to be k local, meaning there are some of terms where each term acts on a finite number of spins. Okay, so no, that's what I wanted to say. No, is there a way to do even better? Well, I don't know. This is the best we found yet. There may be ways to improve still further. Uh, certainly, you know, how we can break ergodicity, how ergodicity breaking can be robust, what new possibilities arise in the ergodicity broken regime is an important open direction for our program. And with that, I will conclude. Where? Lincoln. Yeah, I thought Steve was sitting right behind me. I'm like, oh. Lincoln. Okay, so is it okay if I answer? Yeah, no. your answer. Okay, so uh, two related questions. A lot of your arguments ha about integrability as sort of being done and resolved, and, and this being an important new direction was about the robustness uh, in response to you know perturbation, and also the robustness in the thermalization process, right? Okay, and so two questions about that. You know, one. Uh, are you do you have proofs formally for non abelian cases for classical and quantum integrable systems because those are thought to possibly be more robust? At least there's discussion in the community about that. And two, in national NIST devices, you know, you have a finite space time volume to work with. I feel like you're always assuming, sort of, you know, you've already scaled in space and now you make a statement about time, yep. but you've shown that space and time are related through this fractional diffusion relation or, say, fracton hydrodynamics. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on this relative scaling in space and time for NISC devices? So both questions are related, but they both get... Okay, so let me address maybe this 
Ah, yes. There were two questions. I'll address them in reverse order. Uh, so the second second question, which I'll address first, uh, was about scaling with finite system size and scaling with finite time. So how things scale with system size and time is absolutely a very interesting question. Uh, and you know, in general, we do know how things scale with system size and with time. Uh, so you tell me how big your system is and like how you want to scale your system size. I'll tell you how time scales scale. Yeah? So I mean, those are questions to which we have answers. They're yeah, they're related. This the first question, which I'll address second, uh, was what is proven about integrable systems uh, with non-abelian symmetries? Uh, and to that, I don't know the answer. I think nothing is really proven, as best as I know. So um, the classically ergodicity breaking was you know, known for glasses and spin glasses. Is there any relation between those classical examples and what you've talked about here? Yeah, so I mean, I would say, so the question was, is there any relation between the sorts of things I talked about today and glasses in the classical stat mech? So I would say that you know, the things I talked about today were forms of quantum glasses. Yeah? I showed you three different routes quantum glossiness with different degrees of robustness. So it seems like you kind of argued that yes, there, there is like a fraction of the Hilbert space according to the symmetry sectors, but now there's like additional ways of fracture based on the constraints. Mm -hmm. So, so are these two, two things somehow related? Or can they be made related through this uh, one form symmetries or, or it's really? So, so the question was oh, so I said that the M evolution matrix block diagonalized by symmetry sector and then it further block diagonalized into subsectors. And the question can the subsectors be understood as some additional symmetry? Yeah, in, in a way, because constraint is sort of like a symmetry. Maybe yeah. it's not sort of. So, I mean, I, I would say that the sub blocks cannot be understood as any symmetry of a conventional type, uh, meaning, you know, made from local operators or asymmetry operators, commutators with local operators should be local operators. And you can always, okay, if I had a single eigenstate, a single many body eigenstate, right? I could define the projector onto that many-body eigenstate. That's a conserved quantity. Is that a symmetry? Well, it's completely non-local. Very naive question. Yeah. Concerning one and one, this physical mechanics relies on ergodicity. Um, in fact, the real world is not ergodic. It's, the air in this room will never, in the age of the universe, all gather that corner over here. What difference does that make? Yeah, so the question is, uh, if I have, so the air in the room will never gather all in one in one corner. I mean, so usually what we assume is that we can average over the entire asymmetry sector. Yeah? And configurations like all of the air gathering in one corner of the room are you know, sort of probably measure zero in the thermodynamic limit so that they don't affect the average. Now, in the sorts of examples I was talking about, actually, there's two sorts of behavior you can get. One sort of behavior, which you could call stronger ergodicity breaking, uh, is when even averages over the over the symmetry sector would give you the wrong answer, uh, where you know ergodicity is broken for almost any initial condition. That can happen. Uh, the other example is weak ergodicity breaking. Where you no, know, for typical initial conditions, the average over the symmetry sector gives you the right answer. Yeah? Well, There's some special initial conditions for which it gives the wrong answer. Ergodicity is broken, but for some like, measure zero set of initial conditions, that's also possible. You can get transitions between these sort of strong and weak ergodicity breaking regimes. Yeah. So I wanted to follow up on the question regarding the quantum spin classes. Okay. Of course, the driving force is this order. Um, and if I understood you correctly, you said that one can look at these two different routes mm -hmm. to quantum ergodicity breaking and quantum spin glass physics. Quantum glass physics, anyway. Yeah. I can kind of do that for MDL, yeah. 
but it's not quite clear to me for the other two routes. Can you elaborate on that? So the question was, you know, for connection to quantum glass physics, uh, that it's very clear for MBL, which connects strongly to quantum spin glasses, but what about the other two routes? I would say the other two routes, uh, I mean, the closest analog is in kinetically constrained models of classical glass. Uh, so in fact, now we'll sort of get into the history of fractons a little bit. So fractons sort of start with Damone in 2005 and Ha in 2011, but there's precursors. So those models were quantum generalizations uh, of classical models by Newman and Moore, which were sort of classical kinetically constrained models of, uh, you know, of classical glass. Uh, now, you know, those models don't have ergodicity breaking as strong as what I talked about, uh, but those models had you know, kinetic constraints which were discrete, so sort of Z2 type. So essentially in going from those sorts of models, the sorts of the fractonic symmetry models that I showed you today, main thing we did is we took those old Z2 type constraints from the sort of classical kinetically constrained model literature, and we upgraded them to U1 constraints. Upgrading from U, you know, Z2. So you know, these are sort of souped up versions of classical kinetically constrained models where you've taken Z2 constraints and upgraded them to U1 constraints. Yeah, I just had a quick comment related to your response to the question about symmetries versus constraints. I mean, one very natural way to define a symmetry is as something which commutes with the Hamiltonian or the dynamics. And so from that definition, even the constraints would also be symmetries. Have you ever, I mean, I don't even know how to-, how to... So the question was about symmetries versus constraints and you know, whether they're really different. Yeah, they're not really different. So you know, a simple way to see that is, take this last example I talked about, where I was enforcing a non-intersection constraint. Yeah? I could always say that the number of intersections or the number of constraint violations is an emergent symmetry charge. And then I could sort my spectrum according to the number of constraint violations. And then say I'm working in a single symmetry sector, uh, which is a sector with no constraint violations, or the, the sector with charge zero. That's a completely equivalent way of thinking about things if you prefer to think about it that way, sure. I think, I think we'll stop. Um, I'm wondering if for fractons and the higher form symmetries, you could comment on the role of physical boundaries on this non ergodicity uh, So we can do it with open boundaries. So, oh, the question was if I could, you know, for the latter two versions, if I could comment on you know, the role of boundary conditions. Uh, and I think, now let me just say that you can do it with open boundaries, which is, to my mind, sort of conceptually cleanest, most interesting. Now, you know, this higher form stuff we first discussed with periodic boundaries, but sort of periodic boundaries are here is game. You can do it with open boundaries. Let's take one last question then. How close are we to experiments, starting from the bottom up? Ah, uh, the question was, how close are we to experiments starting from the bottom up? I'm going to ignore the latter part of the question, and I'm going to answer it starting from the top down. Uh, so, you know, for many body localization, actually, there's a lot of experiments. Uh, you know, a lot of the early experiments are in the context of ultra-cold atoms. Uh, so from Emmanuel Bloch's group at Munich, uh, from Brian DeMarco's group at Illinois, and so forth. Uh, but there's also sort of settings in solid state. Uh, so you know, Sarang and I had work where we sort of interpreted some results on nonlinear spectroscopy on phosphorus disturbed silicon in terms of you know, some MBL type of inspired ideas. The second thing, fractonic symmetries, again, there's, exper so there's experimental realizations again. But here, the existing experimental realizations are in synthetic systems. So there's realizations in ultra-cold atoms, there's realizations with superconducting qubits, there's realizations with super trapped ions. Uh, for the third, well, there's no experiment that's been done on this yet, but then we only proposed it a few months ago. Uh, and you know, the Hamiltonian does seem like it should be realizable in Rydberg atom setups. Yeah? In fact, you know, the sort of basic constraint is like, motivated by um, that's Rydberg natural. Uh, so if I had to guess, I would say the first implementation would be in Rydberg atom, you know, again, synthetic uh, setups. All right, thank you very much. Let's, um, let's thank you again.